record. All right. Welcome to today's episode of Disasters in History. Today we're doing the Our Lady of Angels Fire from 1958. Uh, most of the photographs that you see in the presentation today will be from the Chicago Tribune website. Otherwise, uh, they will be labeled uh, from their sources. So uh, again, if you have questions along the way, use the chat box. And then I will do live questions toward the end or at the end of the presentation. Thank you for being here. And again, let's advance the slide. Okay, so what is this Disasters in History series all about? Uh, mostly it's the history rocks. I was trained as a historian, as an undergraduate and a graduate in the field of environmental history, but other forms of history as well. I've always enjoyed American history. Uh, it, Obviously, I'm in the fire service. I've been in the fire service since March of 1998. I'm a risk reduction specialist. So this series combines all of those different interests uh, and allows me to teach and share my passions with audiences. And ultimately, we're trying to learn from past disasters so that we can make better choices for ourselves, our families, and our coworkers today. I'm hoping that I can change your knowledge and that you can in turn change your behavior or share that knowledge with other people, paying it forward to change their behavior, and uh, we can all change our conditions as well. Some of the past topics that I've covered, and I, I know some of you have been to these, the uh, Triangle Fire of 1911, nightclub fires in the 40s, uh, plane crash in 1970, Mount St. Helens 1980. Recently, I did the Excel Energy Cabin Creek Fire from 2007, and uh, we've got, I have other ones for the future that are already made and ones that will be, uh, that hopefully I create over the next month. This week, we're talking about school fires. So pop quiz, no offense. I know that uh, everybody's happy about a quiz this time of day, but when was the last time someone died in a school fire during the school day at a K-12 school in the United States of America? Give you guys a chance to think about that. And if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and uh, share your answer. See what we're thinking about here. It's probably a copywritten song. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, since nobody's really playing along, oh, here's something in chat. That's a great, great way to do it. Okay, 1958 says Amy. Uh, Amy's correct. It's 1958. It was the last time that someone died. Whoops. You didn't all need to see that. The last time. Someone died in a school fire during the school day at a K-12 school in the United States of America. In fact, it was December 1st, 1958, which is the fire that we're talking about today. Now, for those of you who are familiar with my shtick, you know, I like talking about the psychology of risk. Uh, so both of these books, again, and the, the psychology of how humans react, how humans act, it's all part of this story today as well. On the left, we have Tally Shiro. She's a psychologist. She wrote a great book called The Optimism Bias. And she explains how we as humans overestimate positive things happening to us and underestimate negative things happening to us, which can explain why we don't adopt codes when it's presented in front of us, why we don't do drills when, when it's recommended that we do drills, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, again, it's Tis the season of buying gifts. So if you're not sure about mine, you can certainly, uh, I encourage you to buy her book if you're into psychology and how humans react. What, one of the things that this book taught me, and I, I mentioned this at the live presentation yesterday, I have a lot more patience for our fellow humans. It's easy to call humans stupid or dumb when they make bad choices, but are they making a bad choice, a bad choice willfully or is it just because that they're plagued by this psychology that in their, in their uh, subconscious, if you're not thinking about it too hard, uh, it's easy to overestimate something good happening. It's easy to underestimate something bad happening in your future. It's only when we train our brains to consider more of that reality that we can overcome the optimism bias. And that goes very similar with the black swan event that we as humans have learned from observations and experience. And it's not until we experience something that it's far more likely for us to be able to act on it or react to it. So 
give your, give your fellow humans a break, which a lot of us do, at least those of us in the community risk reduction fields and firefighting fields. We like to tell stories about the public, but ultimately uh, I think we're pretty good at giving them the benefit of, of the doubt, and that's pretty cool. So another part of this uh, presentation today is remembering some fire science uh, theory, some fire science ideas. So uh, as we know, the fire triangle is heat, fuel, and oxygen. We need all three of those in order to have a fire. Hopefully we're also familiar with thermodynamics and that's the picture on the upper right. That's the mug of hot cocoa, which is the, quite honestly, the best way I've figured out to teach thermodynamics or convection, radiation, and conduction. As a reminder, if you've got a mug of hot cocoa in front of you, put your hand about two inches above that mug, your hand gets warmer. And that's because heat rises, which is called convection. You move your hand to the side of the mug about an inch away, your, your hand is still feeling warmth. That's radiant heat that's coming off of the mug. But that heat doesn't actually warm the air, it just warms uh, salt, or I should say uh, hard surfaces, liquid surfaces, that sort of thing. And then if your cocoa was too hot or your soup is too hot, and believe me, I've been eating a lot of soup recently, uh, you put a metal spoon in there and the heat conducts through the metal spoon uh, and that cools off the liquid in which that, uh, that metal is sitting. So uh, that's conduction. And then it's important for us to remember the process of pyrolysis as well. Before a given fuel can burn, in other words, before a solid or a liquid can burn, it must transform into its gaseous form. And it does that when the fuel absorbs heat. That heat causes the remaining water inside of the fuel to evaporate away as steam. The dried fuel then vaporizes into its gaseous form, and it's the gaseous form of the fuel that actually burns. Most of the particles are totally burned off in the flame, but some of the particles are only partially burned off, or, or, or partially burned, I should say, or blackened. And when we have a cloud of partially burned and blacken the particles above a flame, we call that smoke. And that's important as I like to tell kids uh, because when you inhale smoke, you're not just inhaling black air, you're inhaling the fuel. So if the chair is on fire, you inhale the smoke, you're inhaling chair. And as any good third grader can tell you, chairs are not supposed to be in our lungs. So that's how I like to teach that. Uh, and that's what I wanted to share with you guys. All right, so the Chicago Fire Department back in 1958, Big fire department. And this was, uh, as we kind of learned in the, the last presentation, the fires of 1871, Chicago's always been a big city, a big hub, a metropolitan hub in the Midwest. In 1958, the Chicago Fire Department had six divisions, 30 battalions. You can see the number of engine companies, hook and ladders. They had a snorkel uh, in operation and 13 rescue squads. Each of those companies or squads consisted of five to six firefighters on each shift. Then they had 19 other ambulances, like specific transport patient ambulances that were staffed by two firefighters each. So the, the Chicago Fire Department back in 1958 was already ginormous. Chicago itself, the city limits cover 224 square miles. This is where I like to brag a little bit because my current fire district, South Metro Fire Rescue, covers 287 square miles. But while we have 540,000 residents, Chicago back in 1958 had a smaller area with 3.5 million residents. So that's pretty impressive. And it's impressive to me as a historian that in 1958, half of the residents of Chicago belonged to the Roman Catholic Church. And I mentioned that for this presentation because the Roman Catholic Church, the church culture, church politics, played so heavily into this disaster, which was again, the Our Lady of the Angels Fire. The Chicago Archdiocese was the largest in the nation. An archdiocese is a, a uh, I don't know, I guess it's, it's the equivalent of a fire department, really. It's a unit covering all the, the Catholic administration of a city. Within that archdiocese, there are 424 parishes. And for those of us in the fire service, think of a parish as a battalion. So the uh, city of Chicago Fire Department had 30 battalions. The Chicago, Chicago Archdiocese had 424 battalions. Uh, all told, the Archdiocese ran almost 400 elementary schools, 37 high schools, 21 hospitals, a lot of these other buildings. There were 2,300 priests on staff. 
uh, thousands more sisters and lay people and uh, deacons and and sub bishops and not quite bishops. And I, obviously, this isn't my my main field of study, but uh, the the overhead, the the uh, the personnel of the Chicago Archdiocese was immense. And uh, in the middle of November, 1958. Chicago welcomed its new Archbishop, Albert Meyer. And I'm sure at the time, everybody was a big celebration and oh, it's gonna be great. Suffering from the optimism bias. Oh, there's nothing to worry about. Everything will be fine. And then uh, two weeks later, something happened. Chicago's school system in 1958 was also an impressive beast. It had 897 schools. This was the public school system, 897 schools. But still, they did not have enough room for all the kids that were produced by the baby boom. So by the, the, the greatest generation who came back from or survived World War II, uh, had all these kids. This was actually a, a photograph from one of the Our Lady of the Angels classrooms. And I mean, imagine a classroom with that many kids in. I think these are third or fourth graders, if I remember correctly. But that is a ginormous group of students for one teacher in one classroom. And uh, incidentally, the fire prevention standards uh, throughout the city of Chicago, they were enforced inconsistently. So, uh, you know, little red flags should be popping up in the story here. So let's move over to the Our Lady of the Angels, uh, the parish itself. So this battalion, it was one of the top five largest parishes in Chicago working class neighborhood covering 150 blocks. All of them were first, second, third generation immigrants from the old continent, the old, the old Northern continent, uh, Europe. And you see they were Italian, Irish, Eastern European, uh, Italy, Ireland, Eastern European countries, uh, major blocks of Catholicism. The parish had a church, uh, social hall and a rectory, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But the church and the social hall in particular were hubs of this parish. They were the uh, ground zero for social events, cultural events, economic events, political events for the parish. And each, each Sunday, the, the uh, church had 10 prayer services. And as you'll see, I think it's on the next slide, the church was huge. That's a lot of people coming through that campus on a Sunday. Yeah, there you go. So the campus itself was built in 1941. Again, it included three buildings, the church, the rectory, and the school. The, the rectory was the building where the priests and some of the other staff members lived. Uh, the school, which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about, the school initially had two wings. But then in 1951, it's kind of covered up here, so I'm going to have to move this. Yep, in 1951, the, uh, an annex was built that combined the two wings. And, and you'll see that in the maps that I share with you combined the two wings into a single building. And then there was a, a seven foot tall iron fence around it as well. Okay, so the school, two story school plus a full basement, but only half of the basement was visible above ground level. So half of it was below ground level, half of it was above ground level. Uh, brick and timber joist construction, wooden plaster inside, high ceilings. There were six exits. There was one fire escape that was put in when the annex was put in. Prior to the annex being built, there were no fire exits that went immediately outside from the second story of either wing. There were fire doors on the first floor at the stairwells, but there were no fire doors on the second floor stairwells. So again, those of us in the fire service, those of us in the know or in building construction, hopefully your brains are starting to think, oh, that could be a problem that pops up here in a few slides. In that case, you'd be correct. So here's the uh, basement version of the building. We've got the, I'm gonna use my mouse over here. We've got the chapel, uh, boiler room, coal room. There even was some classrooms down in the basement. So uh, it's some storage, the choir was, had their rehearsals down there. I mean, this was a busy school. The first floor, you can see we've got the, the that was the north, yeah, this is the north wing uh, and the south wing is toward the bottom of the screen. Again, you can see where the annex connected the buildings and that first floor 
it was all classrooms except for a couple of restrooms. And you'll notice on the first floor that with these stairwells, hopefully you can see my mouse, with these stairwells, uh, there are fire doors. So fire door here and here, over here. Uh, even with this stairwell, they had fire doors uh, protecting that, that uh, open area from the hallway and the hallway from that open area. All right. But then on the second floor, notice what's missing in those stairwells. As it's labeled on this map here from the olafire.com website, no fire door. So, I mean, that's a huge difference from the first floor to the second floor. But for the rest of the second floor, please notice it's classrooms are us. Uh, there's not even any restrooms up there. They needed the classroom space so much that that's really all they had. There was a uh, storage room, the principal's office was up there, uh, but otherwise uh, not much else. But classrooms. All right, so uh, the school, and some more information about the school. There were just shy of 1,500 students in this school uh, between the two wings and all three floors, K through eight. And then it turns out that Our Lady of the Angels, they needed uh, more space in a separate building where they had 200 more kindergartners and first graders. It was uh, heated by the coal burning boiler in the north basement. There was a fire alarm system in the building, but it, was, it only notified the occupants, didn't notify anybody else. So that's what we call a local system. No smoke detectors in the building, no sprinkler system. The doors to the classrooms uh, looked like the door in this photograph here. Now this is not from the Our Lady of the Angels building, uh, but it was the, the best version that I could find online to il illustrate what a transom door looks like. So the door was uh, six foot six inches tall, which when I'm wearing my shoes would just scrape the top of my head. Uh, and then there was an 18 inch transom window on top of that. Uh, and those transom windows were to allow airflow from classroom into the hallways. Uh, and I'm sure, it, I mean, from a certain perspective, it looks cool as well. But when we're thinking about fire behavior, we know that hot air rises, we know that smoke is hot air. So if hot air is rising, smoke's toward the ceiling, I don't know that we really want windows at the top of a door to let that bad, bad air into the next room. Uh, a little side note, as it turns out, uh, the International Building Code currently uh, is an allowance or as a, uh, to provide for better circulation for air circulation, energy efficiency in buildings is allowing for vents to be put in the uh, wall right above doors in sprinkler buildings so the airflow uh, can happen more effectively. But if your local jurisdiction has opted out of the sprinkler part of the fire code without making the other, the, the related changes, that means that as we have in part of our fire district now, we have bedrooms that are being put in with vents above doorways uh, without the sprinkler system. And so when we are telling families and kids in particular to close their door to, to prevent that flow path from occurring, the building code and the way the building code is being applied is creating a flow path for that smoke anyway, despite our best efforts. So just something to think about in your own jurisdictions. All right, so 1949, city of Chicago passed a new municipal code requiring new schools to be constructed of non-combustible materials and they contain enclosed stairwells with fire doors. But I'm sure it was, there was no chance it was related to corruption or graft or anything like that but it was uh, the municipal code was not applied to or to retrofitting existing buildings. So new schools, this would be this life-saving idea was applied, but of the other schools the, the four, the 399 church schools and the 897 public schools, just elementary schools, uh, this didn't apply, which makes me, which makes me wonder what is going on. All right, December 1st, 1958, let's get to it. It's the first day back after Thanksgiving holiday. All the families, the kids were, well, most of the kids are probably excited to be there. Uh, it was 20 degrees when the school day started. So it was a cold December day in Chicago, as if there's non-cold days in December in Chicago, right? 
Uh, at approximately 2.30 p.m., a fire ignited in a 30-gallon cardboard trash drum in the bottom of the northeast stairwell. Uh, the custodian who, according, depending on the, the version of the fire that you read, this custodian, Jim Raymond, gets a lot of grief that maybe he even started it or he didn't do enough to stop it, that sort of thing. It's a lot of uh, uh, victim shaming, in my humble opinion, although you all know I'm not that humble when it comes to my opinions. So the fire starts, Jim Raymond sees it. He goes to the rectory next door and tells a housekeeper to call the fire department, not 911, because that didn't exist yet, but to call the fire department. And then Jim runs back to the school uh, using a different door to get in because that area was no longer tenable. You can no longer be in that part of the building. He goes back into the school to try to start the evacuation. Why did Jim Raymond care? because his kids attended school at Our Lady of the Angels. He was a dad, and as a dad, I can tell you, I'd be running back into the school. So the fire grows. You can see in the, in the image here, the fire's at the base of the Northeast stairwell. There's uh, Avers Avenue out here. There's Iowa over here. There's the Northeast stairwell. And the fire's just kind of seething around, smoldering around in that cardboard bin. Uh, but it is raising, the, the fire is raising the ambient temperature in that stairwell. We've got cool air outside the stairwell outside, we've got a, a window there, we've got hot air inside, and eventually, for whatever reason, a window breaks. Fresh air rushes into that space and the fire explodes. It explodes up the stairwell itself. It also goes into a chimney that has direct access, gives the fire direct access to the attic space. So again, let's talk about these flow paths. On the first floor, the fire doors were closed. So as the fire rolled up into the first floor stairwell, the fire didn't have a chance to get into the hallway. Great news. But there was no fire door on the second floor. So the fire, when it got to the second floor of the stairwell, it rolled out, the smoke and the heat rolled out into the hallway and filled the hallways. And like I said, the fire was already up into the attic at this point as well. So here's another version uh, of the map. This is from the olafire.com website. At approximately 2.34 p.m., this is what the fire looked like. It's, it's hard to see. The fire has filled, fire and super hot air has filled the northeast stairwell. It's filling the hallway. It's filling the attic space. And this is all in the north wing. It's not getting into the south wing yet. It's in the north wing. Two south wing teachers smell smoke, but they remember the rule that only with the mother superior's permission could they activate the local fire alarm system. Now, this is where the, the politics, the chain of command for this culture, and I don't say that in a bad way. I mean, the fire service, we have our own culture as well. So when the Our Lady of the Angels uh, Catholic church school uh, culture, the only way that teachers could leave their classroom, the only way that teachers could activate a fire alarm was with direct face-to-face -face permission from the school's principal, who was Mother Superior, the, the, the lead nun, the lead sister. Now, these two teachers couldn't find the uh, Mother Superior, uh, but they actually opted to uh, evacuate anyway. So they broke a rule, but I think they were probably forgiven for this one. Uh, but that was the rule, that was the culture in the school. And before we dog on the Catholic Church, I, I gotta tell you that Working with larger businesses in my current fire district here in the 21st century, there are other large businesses with big workforces that have a, let's say, a significant role to play in the public good or providing for the public good, where employees are not allowed to evacuate or activate their emergency operations plan or, or even uh, start activating their incident command center until after administrators huddle together and decide if that's actually the right thing to do. So, you know, 60 years later, maybe we've made good steps forward. And in some ways we, we haven't learned these rules yet. So as a historian, I'm, I just wanted to share that context with you. Approximately 2.42 PM, the teachers evacuated their students outside of the church. One of the teacher returns to the school and decides to flip the switch to activate the alarm. 
Now that was at 2.48 p.m. according to eyewitness reconstruction. The other teacher stayed outside with the kids. But remember, this was a local alarm. And at this point, 18 minutes after the fire started, most of the people in the school knew there was a fire at this point. But unfortunately, if they hadn't reacted already, at least in the North Wing, they really had no options at this point. Because you can see that, again, with this reconstruction, the fire had filled the stairwell, fire had now filled both hallways in the north uh, wing, and it was all through the attic space. And it was actively burning the, the wood joists up in the attic. Uh, someone, I don't know if it was uh, the, the housekeeper uh, at the rectory, I don't know if it was just eyewitnesses outside, but the fire department at this point was notified. They were using, the uh, witnesses were using the box alarm system, telegraph system, and they were uh, using their phones to call uh, the fire department. Approximately 2.47 p.m., fire has filled the attic, smoke and fire filled the second floor hallway so that one, that primary way out of the building is gone. Uh, the school rule, again, never leave the building until the fire alarm rings. And one of the students, several of the students actually, remember their teachers telling them they can't go until they're told, until they're given permission to go. Imagine your kids being at a school where they know there's an emergency and the teacher not having enough, I don't know, enough confidence, but also being put in a position where they can't do anything using their own brain and their own judgment without direct permission from their supervisor. I don't know. It, it, again, it's context. I get it. But still, it's like, holy moly. Approximately 2.52 PM, the fire has been burning for roughly two, 22 minutes. Witnesses outside the building remember seeing the window space is just filled with the faces of kids and their teachers and the, the smoke billowing over their heads. So students start jumping from the windows and that was 25 feet up. Remember when it comes to a fatal fire, uh, or excuse me, a fatal fall, your height is how far you have to fall to pretty much guarantee, a, not a guarantee, but you have got a good chance of getting dead with a fall from your height. So for me, a fall from 6'5", there's a good chance it's going to be fatal. These kids, 25-foot fall, not just a 25-foot fall, but then landing and being out there in the super cold air, I mean, that was not a good combination. Approximately 2.55 p.m., part of the roof collapsed. And the roof collapsed, as you can see on the, the graphic on the left. It collapsed uh, mostly in the rooms 208, 209, 210, and the hallway. Uh, so it wasn't a full collapse. You're going to see in some photos later, you might see some firefighters on the rooftops, but it was a partial collapse. And at that point, those rooms, everybody left in those rooms, they, they were done. So I'm going to show you some uh, photos of the fire itself. Again, uh, from the Chicago Tribune, unless noted otherwise. So here you can see a couple of firefighters on the roof of the north wing, other firefighters climbing up the ladder. extreme fire behavior. There was uh, on the left, we've got uh, Chicago snorkel in operation. Uh, lots of ladder work on the side there. On the right, a lot of police cars. You can see fire trucks crammed on these roads. Definitely a residential street. So unlike the Coconut Grove fire in Boston where the street was super narrow, this time, in this case, there was more elbow room, but there were so many witnesses, there were so many cars on the road that it was still kind of a, a, a major gridlock scene. But because of that, ambulances couldn't get right to the school. And so witnesses were scooping up kids, putting them in whatever vehicle was available and zipping them off to the hospitals. Police cars, delivery trucks, uh, like milk delivery, newspaper delivery, uh, the ambulances, all sorts of vehicles were marshaled up to carry patients to the hospitals. And when they arrived, as this one witness said, I've got lots of kids here and they're all burned. Remember, this is 1958. Uh, and these kids and, and adults who were in the fire, they were suffering from burns, airway issues from smoke inhalation, but also the superheated smoke. So their airways were swelling shut. 
trauma from the falls, exposure to the cold, these, these uh, patients were in a world of hurt. Hospitals all over the city received patients. St. Anne's received over 80 patients. And I don't know how these hospitals in the 50s dealt with this, but uh, the, the nurses, the doctors, the technicians, the, the volunteers who showed up and stayed, uh, all heroic efforts. You'll notice that some of the hospitals received patients that were dead. So they were the, these patients were being picked up from the scene, loaded into the car, hauled to the hospital. And when they walked in, that's when the hospital staff were like, sorry, this patient's died already. Uh, so, and I don't know on a map, I have a feeling that St. Anne's was closest to Our Lady of the Angels, uh, but ultimately all these hospitals were involved in this effort. 95 children died, three teachers died, and the neighborhood was absolutely devastated. Uh, just after the various shootings that we've had here in my part of Colorado, I know how a, a neighborhood can be devastated or uh, when we, when I was up in the mountains and there would be a, a shooting or a fire or even a, a, a car crash where maybe two or three people died, a, a neighborhood could be totally devastated. But imagine in a tight neighborhood like the, the Our Lady of the Angels Parish, where almost 100 people die in a single event. It's unfathomable. This map shows the, the green square there is the Our Lady of the Angels campus. And the red triangles are homes where at least one, if not more, patients uh, lived and, and then subsequently died in that fire. Everybody in the neighborhood knew someone who had died, basically. Room 208. Now it's easy, it's easy when I'm teaching these historical tragedies to forget about the human element, and I don't want to forget the human element. So in room 208, the day started, they had 47 seventh graders in that classroom. Uh, the fire killed the teacher, Sister Mary St. Kenise Ling, and these 11 students. So the day ended, they were down 11 students. And this is what the classroom looked like after the fire during the investigation. Again, uh, this classroom 208, uh, the, the roof collapsed over the entire classroom. Room 209, only two of the eighth graders in that room died. Uh, but again, imagine a, a classroom with 62 eighth graders. My daughters are in eighth grade, and I can't imagine them and 60 of their closest friends in a single classroom. This was their class, or that classroom after the fire. Room 210 started with 57 fourth graders and their teacher. The teacher died, and I did the math last night. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, tw 27 of their students died. So at the end of the day, only 30 of those fourth graders were still around. This was that classroom afterward. And notice, too, how tall the windows are, how far up off the, the floor the windows are. So for Little kids, eighth graders could handle that, but for the little kids, had there even been a ladder put at those windows in time to get out, uh, it would have been a, a tough crawl up that height to get to the ladder. Room 211 started with 64 eighth graders and all these kids died. This was their classroom afterward. Room 212 started with 55 fifth graders. They lost their teacher and all these students. Now in their classroom, notice that there are a lot of books that are not burned. So these kids were dealing with the superheated smoke. So a lot of them, according to the, uh, the investigation, a lot of them died from asphyxiation rather than the, the burn injuries. Not only was the parish devastated, but the entire city mourned this amazing tragedy. The Illinois National Guard Armory was one of the largest spaces in the city, and so they held the most funerals, including joint funerals like this one. This was a, a photograph from the service for the three sisters who died. So let's have an investigation. Great idea. 
Turns out the school passed its annual fire inspection in October 1958. Any of these cases, uh, when I read about this back when I was a fire inspector, it reminded me that my diligence was imperative. And I know that our, our fire inspectors uh, across the country do a great job for the most part today, but if you need a reason to spend an extra few minutes talking to the business owner, think about, think about what that inspector felt after knowing that, well, they passed their inspection in October, and now this inspector's got this PTSD vicariously from having the fire in the building. So the investigators found burn patterns and evidence at the base of the Northeast stairs showing that the fire had started there, but they couldn't pinpoint what caused the fire. They were able to rule out certain causes, as it shows on the slide, but they were not able to pinpoint what the actual cause was. They did know from witness statements and from the uh, evidence that the fire burned undetected for at least 20 minutes. So the coroner for the city of Chicago or for Cook County, I'm guessing, uh, brings in a jury to consider the evidence to see if charges should be filed. And several of the parents testified. I'll let you read their statements here, but really what the bulk of their testimony came down to, this was a tragedy. Uh, please don't let this ever happen again. And I would love to tell their, these parents that it never happened again. I don't know about your districts, for those of you who work in the fire service, but in our district, we get pushed back every once in a while. Why do we make schools do monthly fire drills? Why do we make, why are we such sticklers about the art on the walls? Why are we such sticklers about doors and schools and all those other things? Shouldn't schools be left to their own devices when it comes to fire safety? Because after all, nobody dies in school fires. Right. Nobody dies in school fires because we in the fire service have said never again. So I'd also challenge us in the fire service to think, what if we approach this approach other fire issues like 3000 people who died in home fires last year with the same attitude never again we can clearly do it we just need the the gumption i guess the the political equity the the i don't know we need something we can do it we just got to do it the cause was set as undetermined the coroner's jury came up with 22 recommendations including uh, automatic fire sprinkler systems, closing vertical passageways and non-combustible construction, having fire doors, all corridors and room doors should be fire rated, automatic internal fire alarm system with smoke and heat detectors linked directly to the fire department. Brilliant ideas. Uh, and I say that, you know, kind of sarcastically, but again, it worked. People followed the recommendations. There were no criminal charges filed because the school met the code requirements for when it was built and the 1949 municipal code did not apply. The NFPA released a report that called uh, such schools fire traps. And I can tell you that made waves across the country. So in October, 1961, police in Cicero, Illinois questioned a 13 year old boy about a pair of apartment fires out in Cicero. Uh, during the investigation, uh, three, four months later, the boy admitted to setting fires in both Cicero and Chicago, starting when he was five years old. So that was eight years before. Uh, that means that he started setting fires in 1953, 1954. During a polygraph, he admitted to starting the Our Lady of the Angels fire. That was uh, those three sentences or a quote from him, uh, according to the investigation. But when he started the, allegedly started the fire at Our Lady of Angels, uh, that would have been five years before when he was eight years old. No, when he was 10 years old. I don't know, I'm getting the math wrong. Yeah. So when he was 10 years old, but the age of culpability in Illinois was 13, so he couldn't be charged with the fire. Now, I had a question last night in the live version of this presentation, whatever happened to him? I don't know. He couldn't be charged, so he's just now a just, you know, be, went back to his life. And who knows if it moved on from there to other fires, to other violence, or if that was it for him. I don't know. So after the fire, school safety. 
communities around the nation, schools, fire departments paid attention and started to enforce the frequency of evacuation drills, tighter controls on waste disposal, proper storage, fire inspections had new uh, importance in communities. And the 1966 Life Safety Code published by the NFPA required school areas below grade to be sprinkled. All great moves in a great direction. So lessons for us. Youth fire setting is still a serious problem. And if, in, if indeed the Our Lady of the Angels fire was started by a kiddo, <coughs> it's important for us to remember that when kids start fires, it's not just kids being kids. Anne Maria is still on the call. Uh, she could probably talk for days about the, or at least give us a good scoop on the teenagers who started the Eagle Creek fire along the, uh, the uh, Columbia River. And I don't even remember what year that was, two or three years ago. And the judge handed down a severe sentence, making these kids basically pay for that fire for the rest of their lives. Oh, but they were just kids being kids. And if that is your opinion, uh, I don't know that we can be friends, quite honestly. Kids usually start fires because they're trying to offload all the mental and emotional garbage that we pile on them as adults, or because they don't have good coping strategies. Sometimes they're curious about fire. Sometimes they're just mean-spirited. But ultimately, by using a, a, an agency's or a hospital's youth fire setting risk assessment program, we can get these kids the help they need before they start a big fire. One of those programs, in fact, a nationwide program was created by Cheryl Pogue, who retired from South Metro Fire Rescue about 10 years ago. Uh, she was one of my mentors uh, and she doesn't get the credit she deserves for helping create this national tool for assessing risk among kids who start fires. So uh, lessons for us. Nobody dies in school fires, but there sure are a lot of fires in schools. And those fires typically are small enough to stay in the container or appliance of origin. A lot of times they're microwave ovens. 31% are caused by cooking equipment, think microwave ovens. Uh, some are caused by heating equipment, 40% were set intentionally. And that could be a fire set in the bathroom, uh, set in the teacher's lounge, set in the, you know, wherever it is. Uh, according to the International Fire Code, schools and other occupancies are required to report all fires to the local fire department. We at South Metro have a handout that we push out to our principals almost quarterly now to remind them of that requirement so that we can build partnerships with them and reinforce the idea that these kids, we don't wanna toss them in jail necessarily, but we would like to get them the mental health, mental wellness, resources that they are clearly crying out for uh, through using fire. So we at South Metro Fire Rescue, we're pretty strict. Our fire marshal's office is pretty strict regarding school fire safety, enforcing the monthly fire drill requirement, including in the private schools and the parochial schools. Uh, no more than 50% of wall space can be covered. Hallways have to remain clear. Classroom doors can, cannot be blocked open, those sorts of things. Here's a Here's my bibliography. Of course, the fourth book from the top, I highly recommend that. If you are interested in this fire in particular, that website has a treasure trove of information about the Our Lady of the Angels fire. Uh, you could truly get lost on that website for days. I was, get lost for days. Before I go to the next slide, I also want to uh, do a little shout out to a couple of Coloradans. When we talk about smoke alarms, it's easy to take that technology for granted. The first uh, commercially available consumer proof smoke alarms for a residential setting, the patents were given to uh, a couple of Coloradans. So, you know, yay us. All right, here's the link. I didn't jot this down earlier, so I will do that after I close out the uh, presentation. I'd like you to fill out the, the survey at this site just so I can get a little bit of demographic information and a little bit of uh, information like uh, some quiz questions, answers, that sort of thing to help me as a risk reduction specialist that is program appraisal time. So throw me a bone, take two minutes to do the survey. All right, so let me uh, stop sharing my screen. I'll go to the chat. No, I wanna wait a minute, stop share. That's what I wanna do. 
let me, uh, I'm going to call, pull up something here for you. Stand by, stand by. This over, copy. All right, so here is the link. All right, so uh, if you have questions, this would be a great time to ask them. I do not see any questions in the chat box yet. I'm sure it's because I'm an amazing instructor or because it's the end of the day and you guys are all ready to uh, bail out of this. But if you do have questions, uh, you, you're certainly welcome to ask them now. 